Welcome to the Twimmel AI Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Before we jump into today's interview, I want to thank Pachyderm for sponsoring the show. At the end of the day, real world machine learning is all about the data. You already know this, but manually cleaning and transforming data can be exhausting, inconsistent, and error prone. And it is not the path towards getting your models into production, especially when your data, models, and code are constantly changing. This is where Pachyderm can help. Pachyderm is an easy to use data science platform that lets you productionalize your machine learning tasks into fully automated end-to-end workflows, regardless of language or framework. Pachyderm provides Git-like data versioning and lineage that lets you automatically track every data change and final output result. Imagine automating your entire data science workflow in minutes without ever having to configure a single piece of infrastructure and being able to reproduce any result from any point in time in seconds and with complete confidence. Head over to pachyderm.com slash twimmel to learn more and take advantage of a special limited time offer exclusively for Twimmel listeners. That's P-A-C-H-Y-D-E-R-M dot com slash twimmel. And now on to the show. All right, everyone. I am here with Drago Angulov. Drago is a distinct scientist and head of Waymo Research. Drago, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you for having me, Sam. Hey, I'm really looking forward to our chat. I mentioned uh, to you just a minute ago, it's been a while since I've talked to someone working on AV research. So uh, I am way overdue for a refresher or a uh, kind of a catch up. uh, And I'm looking forward to getting that. But before we dig into the conversation, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in the field. So I'm a machine learning person at heart, and originally I was a perception person, so I I focused on uh, computer vision and 3D perception. After I finished my PhD at Stanford, during that time, I was the first student uh, with my advisor who was focusing on perception, and she had no robots. Daphne Kohler, actually a great uh, professor and well-known in machine learning around, I mean, since the early 2000s or even 90s. So I started the, for the podcast. Yeah, yeah great. Well, it's now she, she's into the uh, biocomputation. Bio stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I was I was the first uh, PhD student that was focusing on uh, machine learning for perception. She she had a very varied set of interests. I got exposed to natural language processing and. Uh, game theory and planning, reinforcement learning and so on. But I was the first to do perception and we wanted to ultimately to do the perception applications in computer vision, you need robots. So we're trying to do the robotics application. And as a result, around that time, she started collaborating with Sebastian Thron, who Mm -hmm. ultimately uh, was a famous robotics professor. He moved to Stanford around the time I was there. And so he was a sort of an, an official advisor. Okay. And so I got a lot of exposure to various robotics problem and background, even though I focused mostly on perception. And then they started this DARPA Grand Challenge team at Stanford. And uh, I was finishing my PhD and graduating, and eventually I went to a startup. So I actually never did self-driving then. After doing the startup, eventually I joined Google and worked on uh, Google Street View, which is another mm-hmm. product that is very close to autonomous driving in a lot of ways. You have vehicles with sensors, they go collect the data. I was the TL for pose estimation and 3D vision on the team, so you need to reconstruct the environment. There's this thing called the pancake in Street View that you can zoom up and down the street. You need to produce some kind of 3D information about that. So as we were doing Street View, Street View was still being invented around those times. This was 2007 and eight. Oh, wow. Uh, so around late 2008 and nine. Sebastian Tran, who was at Google at the time, uh, he started a self-driving project. Mm -hmm. And there I was in in Street View, and several colleagues moved to to join his uh, project, and I didn't. Right? (laughs) (laughs) And so that was one time. And at the time, I felt it's way too experimental and early. And I, I instead went into deep learning. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, we built uh, with, I had a team in Google Research, we built some of the backends and neural nets that ended up annotating Google Photos. At the time when we launched the product, we, were, we worked very heavily on understanding what is in the photos. And once you can do that, you can organize it, you can, you can surface all these like nice albums of weddings and celebrations and so on. And so around that time, when deep learning hit, like self-driving project reached out to me again and said, hey, do you want to switch? And I'm like, <laughs> no, right? So I didn't go again. And that was around 2013 or so. And finally around 2015, in the second half of the year, I felt, okay, I think this deep learning is really starting to work. And I think really the next frontiers are 3D perception and then prediction and so on in autonomous driving. So now I'm sold. I'm ready. 2015. So I went into autonomous <laughs> driving then and I haven't gotten out of it since. Right. So that's my story of 10 years of resistance. Um, oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That tell us about your your specific role at Waymo. Are you you're managing all of the, the research efforts? Are you involved in day-to-day research? Kind of how do you how do you kind of prioritize your time and, and get involved? So when I joined Waymo, which was in the summer of 2018, the role that you know appealed to me at the time was to construct a research team for Waymo. And uh, we actually had a seed of a research team. Waymo was very much focused on production, making the stack and delivering. I think I think they, uh, the leadership there realized that the research team can also be quite helpful at the time. Mm-hmm. And so we started with a team of around six people and uh, started focusing on, on machine learning, all right? And as, as one of the big scaling enablers of autonomous driving, right? So Waymo, for example, we have this amazing milestone driving uh, what we call the rider only in Phoenix. Uh, and currently it's 100% rider only, our Waymo One service, mm-hmm. um, first of its kind. And so we can master complex environments. There, that's a large deployment, actually. It's 50 square miles in which we do, like the size of San Francisco, in which we do fully driverless operations. But I think the ambition always is to scale to many cities and potentially the world, right? And have a driver that can handle the variety of cases everywhere. And I think machine learning is a key enabler to that. So that was from the beginning at the at kind of the foundational question is, hey, what does it take to have a system that can adapt to a dozen cities without too much effort, right? Like what technologies do we need to build to have this property uh, scalability? Yeah. And I think when you think with the lens of scalability, there is a whole set of algorithms and models that come out throughout the stack, right? And so we became this horizontal team that's applied in nature. I think it's similar to some Google research teams that are applied in nature that I used to be on before. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have efforts on all major uh, components of the stack, which are perception, prediction, planning, and simulation. And in all of those, we have teams that try to push the state of the art in the space with machine learning. So we are we're exclusively a deep learning team. And then we collaborate with the onboard teams to transfer the technology developed into the Waymo systems. And of course, we write some papers too. So we started publishing at Waymo half a year after I joined. There was a really wonderful paper at the time called ChaufferNet that uh, did very interesting imitation learning work. Uh, this was still very early in the space and there was some very interesting idea there. So we started publishing that and we have many more publications now. So that this is also now part of the research team mandate. But I think first and foremost, we're, we're focused squarely on helping design the best, most scalable advanced systems to, to really bring this driver in as many cities as possible. Awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about Waymo's general approach to autonomy and autonomous vehicles? My sense from looking at the you know pictures of the, the vehicle is that you're kind of down in this, this sensor fusion type of direction with the LiDAR playing a significant role as opposed to, you know, other companies are uh, vision only based approaches. You hear that, you know, kind of orient us on Waymo's approach to autonomy. I mean, Waymo is a fascinating and unique company to work for because we have been doing autonomy for 11 years. Mm, mm-hmm. And so it is the stack that has been honed in the process through learnings over 11 years. And there's almost like three pillars, if you think about in autonomous driving. There's the hardware, 
Mm -hmm. which includes the vehicle, the sensors, uh, the compute, and pulse estimation systems and so on. But this is an area where we are on our fifth generation hardware, a fifth generation driver. There is an amazing sensor suite at Waymo. The compute is great. I think it's it's basically state of the art compared to anybody. And it's a wonderful foundation now to be building uh, an AI system on top. The sensors are fantastic. Uh, yeah, we have a mix of them. So the main ones are LiDAR, camera, and radar. We try the, all these sensors are complementary. So while there's complexity of mixing multiple sensors, there is a huge benefit in several areas from having active sensors like uh, LiDAR and radar that we're leveraging heavily. And we can go into the details of what these sensors are. And of course, we have the compute to support it, the redundancy in the control and steering, the redundancy in compute. Like it's, it's been thought through. It's a mature system. And it's also the fifth generation driver, which, by the way, we have vehicles, uh, of course, cars, and we have trucks, uh, class A trucks, like the, the huge trucks that haul the trailers on the highway. Both of these are, uh, you know, we have a sensor stack and a compute that is an, a mature system that's set to scale that can bring operational efficiency with this generation. It's, it's designed for this, right? So that's the foundation. Then, of course, we design software and hardware together. And this has been from the beginning. And this has sensor designers working directly with the software engineer and getting feedback both ways. And so that's a unique part of our approach. I don't think uh, the majority of companies have this wholesale approach to, to the software right, and hardware together. So overall, Waymo's philosophy is that we have a modular system that uh, is the driver, as they say, and uh, this driver supports multiple platforms. And the two most notable platforms are the car and the truck, and they, they reuse largely the same models of the stack and they reuse the same sensors, but each is tuned to the specific needs of the, of the environment and the requirements that they're operating. There's some differences be be between cars and trucks and we can talk about it more, right? So that's another thing that distinguishes Waymo. And I guess last but not least, I would say is that of all companies, Waymo is one that has published actually its safety methodology. It has very robust comprehensive set of techniques ensuring and that we can validate a stack for the requirements of fully autonomous driving, which is what we go, removing the driver from the wheel. And this is a methodology that's been held in on our deployment in Phoenix. And uh, furthermore, we have the processes set up where we can iterate an autonomous driving stack at a reasonable cadence, improving it while ensuring the safety of our deployments. And I think most companies are just coming to this part. And this part is really challenging and complex. A lot goes into it. And Waymo has mastered it, to the best of my knowledge, better than most. Uh, you know, we have the, the deployments to, to show. And we have been operating fully autonomous drives in Phoenix since 2017 in small amounts and then growing over time. So before COVID hit, um, we were doing one to 2,000 rides weekly in those areas, and 5 to 10% were fully autonomous. And now we switch to 100% fully autonomous offering in Phoenix. And that has been going for a while now, since I think uh, late last year, October or so. And so far with a good track record. Wow. Wow. So that's some things I can tell you. This space is big. We will. I expect we will blow through our, a lot of time, and you may want to start a series of uh, of talks on autonomous driving. But let's see how it goes. All right. So, uh, just one point that I may have missed. You mentioned you were starting to mention three pillars, and I got hardware and software. Was sensors its own pillar, or is that part of hardware? Or what? I wanted to say, like, I mean, so so if you software, there's the onboard software, and then there is evaluation. Uh -huh. Right, and evaluation includes onboard software, and for example, simulation. We can go into simulation, but I think this is a key prerequisite to scalable uh, deployment of autonomous driving. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, ultimately we drive a lot too, right? So Waymo has over twenty million of autonomous miles driven on public roads. A lot of them with the safety driver. Mm -hmm. uh, so we draw a lot on that experience, uh, but. Uh, if you want to iterate on a system, ultimately these miles that you drive with safety drivers 
they scale only so much. And so simulation where we have driven over 20 billion miles and we have the equivalent, they like to say, of 25,000 cars driving at any given time in simulation, Mm -hmm. that takes it to a whole other level of scalability. And we can talk more about the simulation aspect more, but this is one way more focuses a lot. And of course, now maybe this was like part 2B because it's still software. The part 3 is that we actually have fully operational autonomous driving service and we have been taking a lot of learnings from our customers, learning of what people expect from our autonomous driving service, learning about their concerns and also learning how to best work with enforcement, right? Law enforcement, they have a set of requirements you need to comply, like the, mm-hmm. the cop can pull up can ask the car to stop the food autonomous and ultimately there can be an interaction. And of course, we do a lot of outreach, educating people about the safety and benefits of autonomous driving, working with them. So there's a lot of learnings from having a service that now we can apply to scaling it, right? So this is some, and of course, this touches also regulations, but local government and so on. But that's also an important product aspect of the story, right? And I think Waymo, one of the strategy has been to get it out there and learn from it. And mm-hmm. now continue growing. So you're you mentioned that for several months now you're 100 percent fully autonomous in Phoenix. Is getting from Phoenix to you know the second city, the third city, to what degree is that a research problem versus you know some other type of problem, a regulatory mm-hmm. problem, or a, you know a technical but not necessarily a cutting edge research problem? So it's a mix of things. I think ultimately, as we drive more and more challenging environments, we are also evolving our system to be able to make significant progress there while maintaining safety, right? So the driving is a lot of it is, can you make sufficient progress while being safe, right? And so we feel quite good about our safety and we're working on making sure that uh, the vehicle is and while maintaining safety is assertive and makes enough, like drives comfortably and gets you where you want to go. Mm-hmm. I think I would say that the big challenge is how do you scale to larger and larger areas without necessarily having as much effort on your, both on your engineering and on your testing systems, right? And I think a lot of the machine learning techniques So they can come into the system and make it a lot more adaptable to a new environment. So now you don't need to iterate as much on it with experts or with the current tools we have, which may require, in some cases, you know, humans to be more involved and analyzing what is happening, right? And uh, and introducing smarts into the system. So we have this hybrid system. It's partly ML and it's partly expert design and they work together. So the, we have fallbacks of various kinds that are interesting that, that can address issues with machine learning, which, you know, if it's an example you've never seen, you still need to have reasonable behavior in those cases. So we have the system, but, but the role of ML and the scope is expanding. And as it's expanding, for beneficial reasons, you remove the need to as much expert input in the system and you just start leveraging the data you have. So it's this natural process that is happening. So we're trying to bring about this process, right? Decrease the need of inclusion of human expertise and uh, in motion planning and in behavior modeling and so on and and automating more and more of it, right? And I think the more you do this, the faster you can scale. So it's a question of uh, almost like a cadence, right? So that's what we're in the business of doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's maybe walk through some of these research pillars that you mentioned earlier, perception, planning, simulation, prediction. On the perception side, I imagine that you, you spend some research you know, with this sensor, the sensor fusion aspect of the problem, mm-hmm. getting in the signals from the, the different sensors that you depend on. Maybe tell us kind of where the, the where's the research puck search frontier on those types of issues and how are you attacking it? One of the core pillars in perception is having high performance system, even for very rare cases, right? And this is one of the challenges why just using cameras is difficult. Camera is a passive sensor and um, the variability of the scenes is tremendous. Mm -hmm. So you need to handle all kinds of weather, a whole set of different conditions, very complex uh, scenes, night, day, rain, fog, snow, and all of this is with the passive sensor and and cameras a lot of the currently a lot of the processing is just to apply machine learnings to the schemes 
But machine learning can fail in some cases. Of course, it works well for the majority of cases, but for some strange objects or some strange conditions, it may still misdetect or miss certain objects that are ultimately key to your safety. And so we've had this pillar of the three sensors and LiDAR and radar active sensors. And so they, they give you a very important safety multiplier because then even if camera misses certain objects, LiDAR and radar are catching them. So that is one aspect, right? So now within this setup, a lot of the work in the field is going towards, can we get really good performance for these systems by labeling less data and requiring less human input? So traditionally in machine learning, Deep nets were always quite a great universal function approximator, right? So you, you have a supervised problem, you label, I don't know, say hundreds of millions of 2D boxes in images. And now you design the architecture, you put in a set of reasonable biases, inductive biases to kind of make it sure it generalizes well to the domain to the best of your design. That replaced feature design that we used to do pre-deep learning era. And then and then it does reasonably well. Now the problem is. Any new environment to go, right? Coming back to the theme, well, it, it, things look a bit different. So there's different fire hydrants. Maybe the signs are different, or maybe there's some new signs, and maybe there is some new types of intersections that people have, and maybe some new types of vehicles, right? And then, then you need to go label a lot of that again. Yeah. On at scale, that that's not great, right? And a lot of the work recently has been coming. There's a lot of developments in the last two years including self-supervision, noisy teacher-student, I think always active learning, right, ensembles and, and so on. There's a lot of work there, especially in self-supervision, cross-modality learning, CPC, uh, contrast predictive coding. I don't know if that people follow this, but there is ways to dramatically decrease the need of the data you need to label for your models, right? And so a lot of these techniques we're exploring, right? And uh, that ensures as we switch to the latest sensors, which is significantly different from our previous generation, we don't need to relabel all the data we did last time. So that's one area. And ultimately, in perception, people would say, oh, it's pretty solved. And it is true that in the vast majority of cases, we can do really, really solid behavior. A lot of it is about the long tail, about some corner case scenarios that you know, that we see every once in a while happening, like people lying on skateboards on the road, right? Like we need to be robust to that and we test for this. Or like people jumping out of canvas bags or waving signs, or there's some strange protrusions out of various vehicles. Like there's a pipe sticking out and, you know, the doors open and that was standard. But like, you get the idea. So, so you need to be robust to all of that. And so it goes beyond something like 2D or 3D boxes and a lot, a bit of a richer representation that you need to worry about as you drive, especially in dense urban where the streets are narrow. You need to do really subtle maneuvers relative to everything else. You need to have very stable and robust perception. So a lot of the work goes into those types of directions. Mm -hmm. Something you said made me think about, uh, I guess you were talking about how the environments change different, uh, you know, different time of day, rain, things like that. And on the visual side, there are, you know, techniques like data augmentation, domain adaptation, things like that. To, to what extent do those types of techniques apply when you start integrating in the active sensors? Oh, absolutely all of them apply. I think, I think it doesn't differ by sensor as much. I think I would say that the variability in the active sensor space is less. So mm -hmm. car looks more or less the same in 3D. Mm -hmm. In the, I mean, it varies with the range and, of course, yeah. how you're being hit it, but, but there's a lot more consistency. Okay. And so the models actually tend to generalize more easily. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's also a benefit. I mean, of course, it's a small benefit. I mean, we can train. For computer vision, typically, for cameras, you need more data and you need to worry more about self-supervision and other mm -hmm. techniques. Well, I would say one thing that's interesting. So we're in the game of scalability. Yeah. And there are significant advantages in scalability in terms of having accurate sensor stack like ours, which is camera lighter, right? There, what it allows you to do, and this is capability we did, and actually the research team did work on super accurate perception, especially off board. Like you can get it at the quality of human writers, right? Uh, purely by, by running our system. Mm -hmm. uh, so super accurate perception, really nice bounding boxes across time with all the relationships and that's a really great way to self-supervise your understanding of the scene. 
But what that allows you to do is, because we have accurate 3D sensors, we reconstruct the full scene and how everyone behaved super accurate. And now when we drive, we of course learn from our driver. We see how our drivers in the Waymo vehicle interact with the world and how they negotiate certain situations. Till a lot of the difficulty in, in autonomous driving is understanding everyone's behavior in the context of the whole environment. So there's an intersection and traffic lights and pedestrian lights, and there's markings and signs, and there's people and drivers, and you need to understand how everyone's interacting. So you know yeah. you know how to make progress through this thing, right? So there's this incredibly rich like semantic context to everything. So you can watch how our drivers negotiate through it. We can send drivers or you know and drive, drive through all these scenes. Now, the beauty of having very accurate perception and 3D sensors is that as you reconstruct everyone else's behavior at a fidelity similar to yours, you immediately start learning from all the other drivers. Mm -hmm. And you immediately can have very accurate behavior modeling of objects like pedestrians because you can track them very accurately all the time and potentially not just as bounding boxes, but in a richer ways, right? And so now we... As we collect data, we potentially benefit from acquiring multiple viewpoints and styles. Mm -hmm. And then and then the other big multiplier on scaling, which is how you test your system. In the simulator, we work a lot on learning good agent models of behavior. So you want agents that interact and behave like distribution of behaviors humans do, both as drivers and as pedestrians. And when you have these models, you can populate your scenarios. So you drove through the world certain things happen, you can start playing out other futures and seeing what you're doing them. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge multiplier on the experience that we can get and the experience we can get to either evaluate or potentially even train our system to be robust against. And so there's a virtuous cycle from good perceptions, good sensors and algorithms comes good perception. From good perception come good virtual environments. From good environments, you get a scaling factor of how you can evaluate and learn on the behavior side of your system. And so, so that's a core advantage Waymo has that we are investing in these technologies and we can reap some of these benefits as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've kind of thrown around this, this term, uh, you know, sensor fusion quite a bit. And I'm curious when you, you know, is there a generalization for how you think about pulling together all of this different sensor data are you is it like hierarchical in the sense that you're ensembling things and you've got a model that's only looking at you know radar data and another that's only looking at lidar data and you know those are feeding uh some other mm -hmm. level of model or are there ways that you're pulling all that data together you know as part of training for a single model yeah at what level are you trying to fuse all this information together that's a great question. I think if you scour the literature, you will see that people are exploring different types of fusion, right? So there's early fusion, mm -hmm. where you just take all the signals from all sensors, you somehow mash them, throw in one deep net, and, well, detections come out, or maybe detections and tracking. Mm -hmm. um, there's late fusion, which is, like you said, some you process each stream independently, eventually you combine signals from all of them to track the objects with with evidence from each sensor independently, you fuse it late after you process it significantly in each modality. And sometimes people do something in between. So it's like a mixed fusion where you have a bit of early fusion and a bit of late fusion. Mm -hmm. So I would say that a lot of the players in the space have different philosophies. And I think it's a competing, uh, a little bit of a push and pull. So what is the benefit of late fusion? Well, the benefit is that you train three models typically, you say, hey, you do a radar model, a vision model, and a lighter model. And each of those has strengths and weaknesses, and they're trained on different situations. And ultimately, they'll have very different failures. And so if you have all of them giving you detections, and you have something that then combines them, they have very independent mode of failures. And that's a good property, because now you guarantee that, you know, if one model missed something in one sensor, the other one is very likely to pick it up by the law of independent factors that can multiply the, the failure rate, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so that's great. On the other hand, though, you lose something. And what you lose is that each model processes the data independently without the benefit from context from the other sensors. For example, camera sensor is the most information-rich sensor. Uh, maybe radar does not have probably you tip traditionally radar is the doesn't have as much resolution as the other sensors right and if you had camera context you could parse radar much better 
yeah. but you're forcing yourself to process it independently for a while. So mm-hmm. that's the drawback. But so typically, if you do an academic research style work, if you fuse everything early and throw it in a big net, you will do the best in some objective, like academic objective. Yeah. But you lose something. You lose the independent failure. And what you're risking is that ultimately this model can co train and you have a single model and it can make it can essentially fuse the data in such a way that it just makes a correlated mistake across these cases. Mm-hmm. And you don't have a way to to hedge against it. Yeah. Is it also true that you lose a degree of explainability or interpretability, introspection, whatever you want to call it, when you're fusing early rather than late? Um, I think, that, well, uh, introspection, you can, you can intersperse throughout your models as you go. Mm-hmm. You can always have intermediate outputs in your networks and try to understand roughly up to this point what is understood, especially with auxiliary losses or auxiliary heads that predict at that stage, something relevant that mm-hmm. you can test. So that's a good proper, typically people, when you do end to end type models, you have intermediate outputs and they make your system more explainable. Mm-hmm. Now that said, you essentially you lose the ensembling property. You lose the chance to, uh, it may just happen that you have all the data for the model to catch a scenario, but it just doesn't generalize properly because it learned to, it, it just has some bias that got trained that from these three modalities, this is the answer. If mm-hmm. you did them independently, it might come out, right? So, so you want to mix the two. You want to have some early fusion, but you want to have some late fusion type of property. You need both. And I think mm-hmm. typically my personal opinion, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to comment on what is or isn't in the way most that, but we take these considerations when designing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, another one of these kind of, design considerations that, you know, there's there's this series of dimensions that, you know, the different companies working in the space tend to be opinionated about. And, you know, one of these is, you know, vision versus, you know, active sensor-based. The other is, uh, it sounds like this early and late fusion. Another is kind of the degree to which it's you know, throw everything in a, a deep neural network kind of statistical approach versus incorporation of traditional control systems and control theory. Any comments on, on that and kind of how Waymo thinks about that? So I would like to say we, we try not to be dogmatic. Uh huh. Right. Okay. I think at present, I see significant value still. I'm a computer vision person at some point, right? But I still see significant value in, in sensor redundancy and complementarity. Mm-hmm. I think we are yet to see a computer vision system that robustly detects everything without errors. And so, so this type of uh, complementarity is very helpful also for the reasons of simulation and improving behavior models. There's extra benefits, which people usually don't talk about, but that's another scaling levers that you're trying to gain when you do your systems. That said, I mean, there is interesting trends happening in sensors. The way I like to think about it, LiDAR is becoming much more like a camera. It gets dramatically cheaper over time, and uh, the resolution where it is now compared to just two or three years ago, it cannot compare. Mm-hmm. And cameras are getting more like LiDAR too, because our deep learning models have improved significantly. So the state of the art, for example, in depth estimation in cameras is where it is now is dramatically better than say it was two years ago, right? And so, so there is this interesting melding of sensors. That said, each of them currently has a lot to contribute. And mm-hmm. in some sense, the best camera models, say for depth, you can you can achieve by co-training with LiDAR, mm-hmm. right? If you just self-supervised camera depth, which is a hot field in research, that doesn't work nearly as well accuracy wise, mm-hmm. right? So, so we like where we are with this with the with the multiple sensors, and I think the majority of companies that close to like fully autonomous deployments have a similar type of sensors. So I think it's for a good reason. I think when you think of companies dogmaism or so on, mm-hmm. um, a lot of, I just want to bring about this, right? So to talk about one thing. It matters how you design your stack. Okay. So beyond just what you're fusing and what object boxes say you get, there's a lot of other signals. There's an interface between perception and behavior and uh, prediction, and then potentially between perception and behavior prediction to planning. There is naturally this funnel where you go from sensors and pixels to objects, attributes, relations. You go from perspective projection, like a more complex projection, you need to understand more to really model the world to this more Euclidean space. 
typically at the end, in some sense, if you really had to abstract it, autonomous driving is about boxes that you see from top down moving around and you make sure everyone goes around everyone. I mean, that's an oversimplified assumption because clearly we use a lot more cues than just a bunch of boxes moving like humans interact at yeah. more direct level with gestures and uh, gaze and, and a bunch of other attributes. But to the first approximation, you have 2D boxes moving in Euclidean space. And when you design autonomous driving stack, traditionally in some shape or form, you go from tens of millions of pixels in LiDAR scans and radar and whatnot, to objects relationships like a sparse semantic representation of the road graph, mm. right? And then you reason directly about those things. And I think most stacks are involving in that direction, whether it's, of course, all of them are modular to make progress, but maybe you can try to also be end to end when you do it. So maybe you try to learn what is even the API between these that helps the next task the most, right? And so this is an evol evolving process, but a lot of the companies de design these APIs a bit different, right? And I think I think they evolve over time as as you learn what really helps you say for prediction planning, which are some of the main tasks you need to do. You may output more and more rich perception uh, signal through the APIs to the system, or you can maybe even end to end some of them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's different companies again with different philosophy on this. But you need to think of the whole system holistically. You don't even design the onboard system by itself. There's always the question of how do you test the system? How does it behave in simulation? You need to look at all of this holistically. All of these are tied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and when you're speaking about APIs, we're talking about not necessarily public things, but just the boundaries of different elements of the system and how they relate and the constraints that they impose on how the different pieces talk to and learn from one another. Right. So, you know, say we've only published work in, in the space, right? Like typically we take one piece or one module and we publish some network to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And we have, um, I'm, I'm very happy with the kind of models we have at Waymo. I think we're state of the art in a lot of the tasks as, as evidenced in our, like say, benchmark, external benchmark and our own Waymo open data set performance when we, when we compare to what others do. So it's not enough to just be good in a bunch of standalone models. You need to put them all together. And that's a core part of autonomous driving. You need to you need to design the whole system. And there is not as much research externally on it. Mm -hmm. Because this is harder to, to pull off in an academic setting. But a lot of these companies, a lot of the question is like, which exactly models do I do? What is the interface between them, right? Which signals do I need to pump through? What does that mean for the other systems? And you just evolve it as you go. And each each, each company has its own unique recipe on this, ultimately. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that that is, you know, maybe more so an area where a company becomes opinionated than some of these downstream things. Is there a way that you articulate kind of a philosophy, a design philosophy at, at Waymo that drives these kinds of uh, decisions or the thinking around, around this? So I don't want to go about Waymo design philosophy. I want to maybe share my own take or like what are general trends in the space. Okay. I think, I think the vast majority of companies have a modular system. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because you can make parallel progress. You have intermediate understanding of what parts of your systems work and don't work mm -hmm. and so on. At the same time, you want also to be a little bit end-to-end. -end. You want to evaluate across modules. Mm -hmm. You want to potentially, when, when you evaluate across module and see that a, a, single, a single system does better jointly, then you start changing how the model. So you may start merging models in your model or system, right? I think over time, like it goes from maybe a system with many modules that people at early on, you can put together to make progress and have a coherent or like holistic demo. Then as we evolved and what machine learning is pushing is towards fewer models with richer set of outputs. And it's a process that's playing out, right? And I think in research, we're trying to contribute to understanding way more research, which models should be on our car and how to build them in the most scalable manner. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that in terms of opinionate, we're not, I don't think it, it's, it's really about having, I am opinionated about this in machine learning. You need to really be careful when you des define what success is. When you start a problem, you collect the data, you build the metrics you trust, 
you put in whichever those are. Some of them involve like systems that follow you. And then you see what works best. I'm, I'm really opinionated that data drives the research more even than the models. Yeah. And so I'm extremely focused on making sure that whenever you design a problem, that you have the right validation set in place. So you actually, when you get a result that something works, you know it really works. That's mm-hmm. what I'm opinionated about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think in terms of larger trends, there's some fascinating trends playing out in machine learning that we're learning on and experimenting with. So one of them is that in the last two or three years, there's been tremendous, I would say, I don't know if it's not a revolution, but like there's a penetration of these new types of models. So uh, traditionally, a lot of deep learning was honed in on, on audio and computer vision is the convolutional nets and of course NLP. Mm-hmm. And that was typically recurrent models. Yeah. And then what happened is now graphical neural nets came into prominence and transformers, which is a type of graphical neural nets with a specific structure. Mm -hmm. These types of models dramatically increase what you can do in terms of modeling the semantics of an environment because they work directly on objects and relationships, which is quite a generalizable representation. And it has a lot of inductive bias. And of course, now also these models are very amenable to being trained on lots and lots of data. Mm-hmm. And so I see that, I mean, typically perception is maybe the, the part of the stack that people dearly has got a reasonable hang on. Of course, we still have uh, problems like discussed on the long tail mm-hmm. and so on, but we had reasonable perception. In the last year or two, the modeling ability of deep nets uh, to capture scene semantics and behavior a lot of it driven by various type of graphical neural net models and just moving away from purely drawing the scene as an image and applying a convolutional neural nets, which has its limitation. I think the quality of what we can do and the efficiency has uh, dramatically increased. So this is playing out. And now, now the even more fascinating thing is we are, we are watching, of course, uh, the success of Transformer in NLP, right? And now recently also in, in computer vision. And what the trends that are playing out are fascinating. So it does turn out that potentially having a very, very large model training on lots and lots of data allows you to generalize better than having a small model. And that's not something that in the past we used to do, Mm -hmm. right? And these ways of training and this big data vision, and now that there is models that can support it, offers a lot of opportunity to keep rethinking how the stack should be built and, and, and reach yet uh, new levels of scalability. So we're actively looking at this, but that's a fascinating trend in, in general in the ML. And of course, these models are not perfect. And you know, it's not like you can have a giant model, even if it maybe generalizes in an outboard setting and immediately, I mean, this thing does not launch on the car, right? Like that's a lot of latency constraints and and compute constraints as it should be. But I think onboard and onboard model work in concert and uh, you can leverage this technology still in really interesting ways. So there is, this is a very active field now of beyond just the scaling of models, how do you make really good use of them? And in our domain, again, as you can see, say models like GPT-3, right? Like it's quite impressive what it can do. And yet you can pump it in a bunch of ways too. Right. In our case, you can't stamp our model, right? Like we need to have a system design. Pure ML model may not be sufficient because pure ML model, every once in a while, you get to part of the domain that is new that you've never seen and you need to have a good performance. Mm -hmm. So now we're operating under this challenge and it's a fascinating challenge, uh, but I think there's still a lot to be done in this space. So that's something that's interesting to me to see how all of this plays out and what the learnings are as people are developing it as we speak. Yeah, you said something interesting in describing the way the system evolution in an autonomous vehicle stack where you have these independent models, you look at them from a system at a system wide lens, see which of them kind of co perform better, maybe those kind of combine to become a a single model. Uh, It's making me wonder do you think, especially given your you know, all the experience you've had in this, you know, before you you went over to the dark side of autonomous vehicles, do you think... What is the dark side of autonomous or, or the bright side, whatever side you we want to call it. Meaning before you, you started working in autonomous vehicles, you mm-hmm. worked in other domains. Do you see 
the complexity of the autonomous vehicle domain being like a forerunner to types of things that we'll be doing on other types of problems, meaning, you know, in a, a more traditional ML uh, pipeline, you may have, you know, uh, you may have multiple models, but I'm not sure that I've heard kind of the sophistication of thinking about them as a system and kind of recombining models. And I'm just wondering if that's something that you think autonomous vehicles and and the, the complexity of the models that you deal with will contribute to, you know, tomorrow's enterprise, a way to think about, you know, ML systems. That's a really interesting, I mean, high level question. I would say that where I was going with this is that to me, and I've worked in other fields, right? So I worked yeah. in street view and I worked on annotating photos and some VR and so on. Those previous systems, we would develop a reasonable model and it would function on its own and say, annotate your photos. Yeah. And there is not a high level degree of system integration. Mm -hmm. Right. In autonomous driving, because it's a complete robotics problem, you go all the way from hardware to sensors to, you know, perception, prediction, action. A lot of domains end before action. We have the full, it's a complete robotics domain. Mm -hmm. And it comes with a level of ultimately integration challenges and like anything I had ever experienced before mm -hmm. in my career. And I think it's fascinating, right? But I think one of the most challenging robotic problems of our decade, and yeah. you know, I am an optimist. I feel we're really getting somewhere mm -hmm. there. I think it's a surmountable problem. We're getting a reasonable handle on it. I think because there's such a large market, it's such a hard problem, and there's, of course, a lot of investment in this problem. We're working out a blueprint for many more robotic systems and how to think of them, how to think of their safety, how to think of their testing, right? Like all the requirements that need to be true for that to happen. How do we think of designing complex systems? There's a lot of learning that comes there beyond what's uh, just purely in the, in the academic setting you would derive. Right. A lot of often I've, I've talked to academics and they come to our space and they maybe spend a sabbatical. It's like it really opened my eyes to where the problems are. I think you by being involved with this effort, you really see where the problems are and you can try to address them. And a lot of the problems are of system design. And a lot of the problems is how do you how do you combine these super powerful machine learning models that still make mistakes in a robust way to yield your robust driving? Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting problem. I think the machine learning field is still working through what are good ways, like, let me say, GPT-3, right? Like, how do, you, how do you ensure it doesn't say stupid things, right? And in our domain, we, we can do things like this. And I think these learnings will generalize to other systems. And this is the things we're really strongly thinking about, right? And it, it's kind of pushing you to do it. I think in a lot of applications, we didn't really have to. So when we were annotating Google Photos, you aim at certain reasonable precision, right? Like, people want to find their photos. So what if you said that giraffe is a strudel pie every once in a while? It's okay. <laughs> right? Like, I want to find the giraffes. It's okay to go through a few mirrors. I mean, you don't want too many because then it's not helpful. Like, it's not driving. You can't make this compromise. And it's a really new type of challenge. It's very interesting. And that's why partly you see a, Waymo has this very... Uh, Waymo is ultimately not dogmatic. You say, which is the hill you will go and stand, right? Mm -hmm. I think we want to solve the problem, honestly. I don't think... I'm not a purist. I don't think it should be all end-to-end -end system or a single ML model. Like there is a lot of factors leading you to a hybrid system, both in terms of maybe having several sensors for now, both in terms of building in a very strong ML component, but augmenting it in a hybrid way. Mm -hmm. I think I think this is there to stay. It's there for practical reasons. And yes, I mean the job I see for our team is to push the scope of the ML component. But also you need to be realist. I'm not sure yet. Machine learning is at the point where it could just fully learn by itself a robust system from some data, right? Yeah. This is too big of a space. Imagine the space of all, all possible, you know, conditions and these tens of millions of pixels to have something that just generalizes. This is an open problem and we're approaching it in a, in a sensible way. You need to be very practical when you, when you address this, right? So it's, it's usually a balance of some kind. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Drago, thanks so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're up to and uh, just as importantly, your perspective on the space and, and where it's going. Well, I hope it was fun for folks. It's always a pleasure to talk about this space. I'm personally fascinated by it. And uh, it's certainly 
the most I've been enjoying a space yet in my in my career. So yeah, it's yeah. Well, uh, happy to <laughs> talk to it more in the future sometime. Absolutely, it was definitely fun for me. Thank you so much. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. To learn more about today's guest or the topics mentioned in this interview, visit twimmelai.com. Of course, if you like what you hear on the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcatcher. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.